Hello, my name is Ronald Kim. In this module, the third and last in the series on phonology, we will discuss stress and syllable structure in classical Armenian. Here is a roadmap of this module. First, we will return to vowel alternations from the previous module and their consequences for the position of stress in classical Armenian. We will look at the evidence for final stress and exceptions to word final stress. We will then turn to some of the differences between classical and post-classical pronunciation, which are important for the history of Armenian and the pronunciation, traditional and scholarly, of classical Armenian. We will then examine consonant clusters and the evidence for epithetic schwa, and then conclude with a consideration of syllable structure in classical Armenian. The last lecture introduced vowel alternations between final and non-final syllables, which play such an important role in classical Armenian. The generally accepted view is that these alternations reflect the treatment of stressed and unstressed vowels, respectively. Vowels and diphthongs were retained in final syllables, which were stressed. But in pretonic position, before the stress, meaning in non-final syllables, e and u were weakened to zero, and the diphthongs a and eu were weakened to e and u, respectively. Here we have a table that shows these alternations according to the communis opinio the opinion of most scholars. So we have retention of these vowels and diphthongs in final position, e, e, u, a, which then became a, and eu, which then became oi. But in non-final position, e and u were weakened to zero, and a and eu were weakened to e and u, respectively. Ia does not fit into this scheme since it does not go back to a single Proto-Indo-European diphthong, but arose in the prehistory of Armenian from contraction of various vowel sequences. There is further evidence for the position of stress from the history of Armenian. Dichronic evidence. All vowels in Proto-Indo-European word final syllables were lost by a change known as apocope. Presumably this happened because they were post-tonic, after the stressed vowel. I've given you several examples here. We will just look at two of them. The word for human, mard, which goes back to Proto-Indo-European mertos, but we think that the stress first shifted to the second to last or penultimate syllable, mardos, hence classical Armenian mard. Similarly, in the forms of seven, we have septum, as in Sanskrit or Vedic septa, right? That shifted to the pre-final syllable, or penultimate syllable, once eotin, the n, is preserved, the vowel has been lost. Finally, if we look at the genitive, dative, and locative of father, we have Proto-Indo-European pachtros, pachtre, pachtri. The stress shifted once again to the uh, penultimate syllable, giving us hour, right? That's diachronic evidence, and all of this evidence points to the position of stress being on what in pre-Armenian terms was the penultimate syllable, but then after this, apocope became the final syllable. Classical Armenian, therefore, had post-lexical final stress, much like modern French. The default position of the stress is on the final syllable. From time to time, it is claimed by specialists in the historical grammar of Armenian that uh, Armenian has preserved, perhaps indirectly, the position of lexical stress in this or that word in, uh, from Proto-Indo-European, but those are not generally accepted claims. It follows that Armenian cannot contribute to the reconstruction of the Proto-Indo-European accentual system because it has this system of post-lexical automatic final stress, much like modern French once again, or several other Indo-European and non-Indo-European languages. There are some exceptions to final stress in classical uh, Armenian as determined by vowel reductions and the traditional pronunciation, as in modern Armenian. Two important categories, demonstrative pronouns and adjectives. I've given you the example of ice with near daptic s. The same things would apply to eid or ein, meaning that 
or that over there. Ice inflects in the following way, genitive icer, dative isum, where the vowel reduction only makes sense if those vowels were not stressed. So it seems that the stress was always on the first element, I. You have the emphatic forms, isoric and ismic, where note once again, the vowel reduction, u, becomes zero. Finally, I space, so, thus, in this way. The other category is interjections, and many of these also have demonstrative value. For example, ahawasik, see here, or ahawadik, ahawanik, see there, right? Uh, where once again we have the datic element. So these are practically the only exceptions to final stress. Otherwise, once again, stress in classical Armenian, as far as we can tell, was always on the final syllable. Let's turn now to differences between classical and post-classical pronunciation. The traditional church pronunciation of classical Armenian is maintained uh, in, among other places, the Armenian Apostolic Church to this day, reflects several changes which we believe were actually post-classical. For example, initial e eh is pronounced ye. Yeah. For example, yerku, two. Similarly, initial o is pronounced as vo, as in voch, not. Word final i and oi are pronounced as simply a and o, respectively, except in monosyllables, so we have high Armenian. Non-final oi is pronounced as ui. The diphthongs iu and ea are pronounced as following u and ya. And finally, velarized l became l, the voiced velar fricative l. In addition, the following changes affected the vowels. As mentioned in the previous module, a merged with e. The high mid front vowel a merged with the low mid vowel e, except in initial position. We've seen that initial e became ye, but initial a remained a and did not develop a glide. In old Armenian manuscripts, in addition, a is often written for e before a vowel, suggesting that these two sounds already merged in that position. For example, we often see spelled ein for ein, they were, imperfect third plural of b. And another example which we will see in the first reading passage from the Armenian Bible, Galilee for Galilee, from Galilee, the ablative of Galilee. The other change is the monophthongization of au to o, traditionally transcribed as long o to distinguish it from the other o. There's no evidence that it was actually long. This is written with a new letter o from the 12th century onwards. So we have, in many of the oldest manuscripts surviving to this day, already spelling such as hor for hour, that is the genitive, dative, locative, singular of father, or isor for I sour today, literally this day, as still in modern Armenian. This has consequences for the modern orthography. The letter A was replaced with E in the Soviet Armenian orthographic reform of the early 1920s. Hence, for example, Hayeren, Armenian language, is spelled in modern Eastern Armenian Hayeren with two E vowels. This reform was never adopted among Armenians living in the diaspora, so publications in Western Armenian to this day continue to use the traditional spelling, which uh, has not adopted this or many other reforms. In modern Eastern Armenian, A survives only to indicate word initial A, for example, in the place name Ejmiatsin, spelled with, as you will see, the initial A. Right? It is also retained in the present third singular of B, A, he, she, it is, compare M, I am. The uh, vowel O is used only to indicate word initial O, in contrast to vo. So in the recent borrowing, optica, optician, we see it spelled with an o. When did this vowel weakening happen, the vowel weakening that we discussed in the previous module? It seems that it was relatively late since it affected loan words from Iranian and Syriac, but only after the earliest Armenian borrowings into the important language to the north, Old Georgian. 
Here are two examples. The word for Jew, originally from Syriac, Ihudaya, pre-Armenian, Huriai, notice still with the vowel U, and that was borrowed into Old Georgian, where weakening never happened, Hurya. We also have a borrowing, the word for white, Middle Persian, Spetak, borrowed as Spetak, Old Georgian, Spetaki, Armenian, Spitak, with the later weakening. So this was a relatively late change. This change, vowel weakening, produced some impressive consonant clusters, at least on paper. Orthographically, we have impressive clusters such as this word right here, which I will not pronounce on purpose, b, j, sh, k, e, m, I heal, and j, n, j, e, m, I destroy. Addition of prepositions could also produce impressive consonant clusters. For example, ts, the preposition ts, and then nosa, to them. Or z, the marker of the definite accusative, and then b, j, e, sh, k, doctor, definite accusative. How were these actually pronounced? Were they actually consonant clusters, or is something else going on? Manuscripts and the traditional pronunciation agree that such clusters were pronounced, in fact, with epithetic schwa. There is a letter schwa in the Armenian alphabet, as we have seen in the introduction, but it is written only rarely. It is found word initially, for example, in mbem, I drink, or nternum, I read, and at the end of a hyphenated word, for example, serboi, when it is split between two lines, it's written S schwa R, and then on the next line, B O Y. Or Gerem, I write, when it is split between two lines, is written G schwa, and then on the next line, R E M. Elsewhere, it was not expressed in writing, and the only way to understand that is that it did not contrast with zero. The occurrence of schwa was automatically predictable. So, where did schwa, in fact, occur? The rule seems to be quite simple. Classical Armenian had a maximum syllable template or structure of C, V, C, C. Very normal across the world's languages. Word initial sequences of consonants were realized with a schwa between them. There's one exception. If you have a sequence of sibilant, an S-like sound, s, z, sh, z, and a stop, the schwa was apparently before the cluster. Let's look at some examples here. We have that verb, I heal, with the formidable looking cluster of b, j, sh, k. This seems to have been pronounced simply b, j, sh, kem, I heal, with three syllables, b, j, sh, kem. I write garem with a schwa. I destroy jin, jem. It looks scary, but once you put in a schwa, it's not so bad, jin, jem. With initial sp, we have a spitak, white. And notice that the schwa there is put before the cluster. Similarly, izganum, I put on clothes, I dress myself. Izganum with the schwa before the cluster, zga. Finally, preposition plus pronoun, tsnosa, right? With schwa after the aspirated ts. So what looks very scary on paper is in fact as far as we can tell, not so scary in actual phonetic terms. As you see, classical Armenian has a maximal syllable template of CVCC. Where do you find sequences of two syllables at the end of, uh, of two sounds at the end of a syllable? Well, we have complex codas consisting of either a sonorant, that's a sound like N or R, or a sibilant, an S-like sound, plus stop. And as in many of the world's languages, those kinds of syllable codas were allowed. Here are examples with sonorant plus stop, marred, human, durand, where note that the initial dr must have had a schwa, so durand, threshold or door frame, and the name of a major Armenian writer of the early Middle Ages, David Anyalt, right, the invincible one, Olt. In the later pronunciation, yes, that velarized l becomes a l, but in the classical language, this is still a sonorant. 
Then with Sybil and plus stop, I've given you two examples here, Ost, branch, and Ozg, people. So what looks like a formidable uh, Georgian or Caucasian style a syllable structure actually turns out to be much more ordinary in cross-linguistic terms. Classical Armenian had syllables of the shape C, V, C, C, no more, and the occurrence of schwa broke up these apparent consonant clusters and is supported by both spellings and manuscripts and the traditional pronunciation. Shinor Hakadutun, thank you for your attention, and this concludes our three modules on the phonology of classical Armenian.